Greetings all. About two weeks back, a chap called Perun put out a very good video asking if now, finally, is the time that the ATGM has managed to end the tank. It's a very well argued and presented video. I've put a link down below in case you've not yet seen it. As I mentioned in the last video about application of critical thinking, I firmly believe that no, it is not the end of the tank. And since then, others, to include Bernhard over on Military History Visualized, have also put out observations that the death of the tank has been declared many times in the past. And I'll put a link to that below as well. Now, in fairness to Perron, he is very upfront about not coming to the conclusion that tanks are now only so much metal waiting to be sent to the scrap heap. But he makes a very definite argument that the economics are in favor of missiles over anything but the most modern tanks, and the jury is out on the latter. So this is not a counter-argument video. I have no huge points of disagreement with him, some kind of quibbles, but generally speaking, his arguments are well supported. Instead, I'm going to try to explain why, even though anti-tank missiles are getting better and drones and sensor-fused artillery are a newer threat, there are still capabilities that the tank can provide which are still worth it, and why the tank isn't going to go away. Now, of course, there will be inevitable comments. Of course, he's going to say the tank is still necessary. He's a tanker. Or he's a battleship admiral saying that the carrier won't make the battleship obsolete. Or he's a 1930s US cavalryman stating that the horse still has a major place on the battlefield. Well, no. It's down to the capabilities being improved. It's not about vulnerability. If it was about vulnerability, the infantrymen would have been obsolete centuries ago. Look how many trucks are being killed. Nobody's advocating the trucks go away. And so on. The US military structure is defined by a process called JSIDS, the Joint Capabilities Integration and Development System. Note it says capabilities on the tin. It says nothing about vulnerabilities. Figuring out how to get that capability most efficiently to include reducing vulnerability is part of the .mlpf process. Hardware is only the M in .mlpf, and there may be lots of other possible ways of achieving the desired effect other than having a thing, like a tank on the ground. Yet, despite this holistic system, the US not only isn't reducing its reliance on tanks, it's doubling down with the recently announced armored division structures, both heavy and penetration. As the lads and Benning occasionally say, Armor Branch provides about 4% of the US Army's manpower, but about 40% of its combat power. And that's quite an efficiency. The battleship went away because other systems were developed which could do what a battleship does, but better. The first thing to supposedly make the battleship nothing but a target was the light craft of the Jeune Ecole, torpedo boats and battle cruisers. And though, yes, a torpedo boat could sink a battleship for much less cost, it could not replace the capabilities of the battleship. So the latter did not go away because of these battleship counters. Horse cavalry went away because armored vehicles could perform the vast majority of the same roles better. To this day, there is nothing which can perform the same role as a tank better than, or even as well as, a tank. It's the same reason why helicopters are still around when there are so many things out there designed to kill them, or why riflemen are still around even though the bullet seems to have put, had quite an effect on them, especially since automatic weapons were invented. This is a point which Perun makes very specifically, that the tank is going to last as long as the doctrine requires a tank. So, since other folks like Bernhard have put out videos explaining why this isn't a new argument, instead, I'm going to try to explain what the tank can do to help the doctrine. Before going into discussing the tank's benefits, I'm going to refer to a couple of historical data points. Some forces which used to have tanks have entirely divested themselves of them. Belgium is probably the most significant case in point. They used to have over 300 Leopard 1 main battle tanks. Today, they don't have a single tank, direct fire capability now being provided by about three dozen 90mm and 30mm piranhas. The Belgians seem to be more the exception, though. Other forces also made the decision to completely abandon tanks, such as Canada and Netherlands and the US Marines. However, all three of these came with an asterisk. The Dutch used to have almost 450 Leopard 2s, and their total retirement was announced in 2011. 
and other nations gleefully snapped up a lot of them. However, the Dutch did realize that losing the skill set completely was probably a bad idea, so they dragged a company's worth that they hadn't sold yet out of storage, leased another company's worth from Germany, and now keep their tanking skills current in a multinational Dutch-German unit. The Canadians had announced a similar plan to the Belgians, get rid of all the Leopard 1s and replace them with cannon-armed piranhas or the like, you know, Striker MGS effectively. Suddenly, operational realities drove home, hang on, these things are damn useful and cannot be replaced by anything else. And so, instead of being replaced by lighter wheeled vehicles, the Canadians picked up four score of the ex-Dutch Leopard 2s. The US Marines have similarly divested themselves of the tank, but they are a special circumstance because they are not the only tank operating force of the US military. The practical reality is that the US Marines had sort of turned into a second land army, fighting alongside the US Army, with occasional pretensions towards keeping an amphibious capability. The Marines are now pivoting to perform a much more unique role, focusing on the Pacific, where a tank's capabilities are less important than other capabilities in the theater. If you read Force Design 2030, the Corps' document announcing the divestiture of the tanks, it specifically states that in the priority list, tanks are lower than other systems, and that in those instances where heavy ground armor capability is required, that's what the army is for. It's on page 8. There is certainly plenty of history for this assertion. We saw US Army tanks supporting Marines in Fallujah, and if you really want to do a heavy force beach landing, the Army can have you covered. World War II and Korea showed that the Army are as capable of driving tanks off ships as well as anyone else. The Marines are not advocating that the tank no longer has a place on the battlefield, they are merely advocating that the tank no longer is important enough to the Marine Corps mission for the Marines to put its limited money and manpower behind, compared to other systems of use in the Pacific in the literal fighting that the Corps envisions as its future domain. Another interesting touch point is South Africa, which has generally gone to an entirely wheeled force because of the large expanses of solid terrain. SPGs, recon, IFVs, yet they still think a heavy tracked vehicle is worthwhile. So very few forces are proving confident enough to say the tank isn't worth it. Something Perun mentioned, which I'm a little bit disappointed he didn't dig into, was the request by Ukraine for a supply of 500 a day each of javelins and stingers. Now, when operated by someone who knows what he's doing, javelin isn't supposed to miss much, and it's fire and forget. But even if you give it an 80% hit rate, which is less than advertised, that's equivalent to 400 vehicles a day, just on javelins. The Russians are certainly not losing 400 vehicles a day, they don't have that many. Neither are the known loss rates particularly equal to the known deliveries, plus whatever the Ukrainians already had. Same situation with stingers and helicopters. So other possibilities. Firstly, he may just be reaching for the sky, asking for far more than he needs in order to try to encourage a higher actual figure. Or maybe he's using javelin generically to mean anti-tank weapon. Or maybe expenditure is actually higher than the known results indicate. Before recording this video, I sent a script to Perun to comment upon, as I'm specifically responding to his video, and he also isn't sure what to make of the requested number. It's far beyond production capacity and seems unrealistic. We don't have much solid data on the effects of massed missiles against armor. Generally speaking, the data we do have comes in the Middle East, and it often seems to involve firing single missiles at single tanks. Or else the data sets are much older, such as Suez 73, or perhaps against uneven forces, such as in 1991. If there is any one example we have where reasonable, relevant data is available, it's Wadi Saluki in 2006. This was not a bright, shining moment for the Israeli army. In fact, these were conditions about as biased in favor of the defending missile teams as they were likely to get. Wadi Saluki is basically a valley with a river running through it, a number of bridges, making show points, and plenty of scrub vegetation, rocks, caves, and so on to hide amongst on the high ground. 
Oh, and it's also a really bloody obvious route of advance through the terrain, which seemed to be confirmed by engineers doing prep work before the tank attack. So Hezbollah had quite a bit of advance warning. Up this valley would be pushed two companies of tanks with some battalion assets, so 24 of the latest Merkava 4s in total, plus some infantry. The Israelis weren't total idiots. They realized that they had the potential to become fish in a barrel. So the plan was to seize the heights with our mobile forces, and the tanks also had artillery on call. Unfortunately, they made a number of errors. Firstly, they figured they might go up against a couple of missile teams. Now, it turned out that Hezbollah fielded closer to 20, and these would primarily have been AT-14 Cornets. Not the absolute bleeding edge of technology, no, but definitely a first line modern missile. Secondly, the air mobile unit supposed to clear the heights apparently didn't. Third, when the Israeli tankers called for artillery to suppress the missile teams, this was denied because the Israeli gunners weren't sure where the Israeli infantry actually were and didn't want to accidentally hit them. I would have thought that, you know, I don't know where they are either, but the enemy is definitely shooting at us from that grid over there, uh, would have been enough, but anyway. The end result is that the Israelis met a swarm of missiles. Best estimates are 50 to 70, but Hezbollah has not, to my knowledge, released an expenditure report. Some claims are as high as the triple digits. From these, 11 tanks were hit, some more than once. Three tanks were penetrated, seven crewmen killed. No tank was irretrievably destroyed, though certainly some were out of the immediate fight. Hezbollah admitted to one dead, who they claim hit all the Israeli tanks running from launcher to launcher, take that as you will. The Israelis failed to push the pass that day, so the battle was an Israeli defeat, at least for that day ultimately. Hezbollah missiles won, Israeli tanks zero. However, if we look at the scope of our discussion, the missile versus tank interaction, things come out a little bit less unbalanced. Cornet and Merkava 4 are basically contemporaries. They came out within about five years of each other and were basically top of the line systems from their respective countries of origin. Now we can always hypothesize the hell out of these things. What if the Israeli artillery had fired as requested? What if Hezbollah had artillery bigger than the mortars that they had to put into the valley? What if the Israeli infantry had cleared the heights as it was supposed to? And so on. Well, they say the winner in a war is a side who makes fewer mistakes. And on that day, that was Hezbollah. But you cannot work your doctrine around the idea that the enemy will make all possible mistakes. You must assume they are knowing what they are doing. Yet, with the situation being almost entirely in the missile's favor, penetrating three tanks out of, say, 50 missiles fired isn't a stellar result. With almost as many launchers as tanks, Hitting less than half of them at all is in the stellar result, regardless of penetrations. Even if we keep our scope of discussion to just a missile tank interaction, you realize that things could yet have gotten a lot worse for the missile teams. For example, the latest selectable fuse tank ammunition, which is very lethal to defending infantry, was not available to the Israelis, and the tanks did not use their active protection systems. No, not trophy, I'll get to that. I'm talking about the active protection system that has been installed on basically every tank since the Second World War. Of the 24 tanks present, not a single commander thought to push the button saying smoke launchers. Now, as an aside, people seem to be confused as to just what an active protection is, and they generally focus on the hard kill types when they think about it. But smoke launchers are by definition a soft kill active protection system. They actively interfere with the ability of an enemy to hit your vehicle. Merkava also has a smoke generation system in addition to the launchers. So a modern smoke grenade will obscure your vehicle within about two seconds and give time to generate vehicle smoke. The smoke grenades themselves normally have phosphorus in them, red or white, and thus will also provide protection against weapons guided by thermal imagers. Considering that smoke launchers have been a system on basically every armored vehicle since World War II, it is astonishing over the various years of fighting in the last couple of decades how often a target has failed to use them. Granted again, there may be a form of survivor bias 
in that our Yemeni or Syrian rebels or whoever are uploading videos for us to analyze are not showing engagements where they miss because the targets popped smoke. But there does seem to be a common result that the tanks were destroyed did not pop smoke. In any case, how many of the 11 Merkavas hit and 3 penetrated would have suffered damage had smoke been used? Okay, moving on. If you are not aware of it, allow me to introduce you to the survivability onion. This is a list of things which all have to happen before you die. If you can prevent any one item of this sequence of layers, then you will live. A tank has a pretty good onion, arguably better than anything else. Before going into that though, allow me to explain the benefits of having a tank. Now as I go through this, keep in mind the question, if not a tank, what other system or technique can garner the same effects? Again, the reason tanks aren't going away is because of what they can do for you. The purpose of a tank is not to take hits. If your plan is to rely on your armor, you're doing it wrong. Perhaps a bit generically, the tank's purpose is to apply fire effects at a decisive point on the battlefield. Artillery provides bigger guns and has the advantage of firing from beyond line of sight. But if you want to provide precise, immediate fires, you need something with a direct fire capability. Could be a Carl Gustav, could be a missile system, could be a fire support vehicle, could be a tank destroyer, it could be a maneuver combat vehicle, an infantry fighting vehicle, or it could be a tank. However, if you want to reach out and immediately touch someone and anyone at a distance, you're reduced to considering vehicles with large caliber cannons. Missiles are too slow, handheld launchers too short range, and autocannon are limited as to the targets that they can engage. A vehicle with a large caliber cannon is supremely suited for engaging anything quickly, effectively, and cheaply. If the target has thick armor, like a tank, Saber rams will do the job. Helicopters can be engaged with fused warheads such as MPAD or tube launched missiles, although granted an ADA vehicle would be better. Light armor, heat. Troops in the trenches or other forms of cover. Fused warheads like APAM or AMP. A group of infantry, or if you need to defoliate an area, allow me to reintroduce you to the concept of canister and beehive. A single large caliber cannon vehicle will carry about 35 to 45 rounds, most of which are, compared to other alternatives such as missiles, very cheap and far faster to get into the tube than, say, an 80 GM team with a, you know, that's a thermobaric round in, in the stash here somewhere amongst all the other shaped charge rounds. Time of flight also reduces the possibility of evasion or retaliation. Nobody is going to react to a cannon firing faster than the round gets to them. A modern cannon armed vehicle will normally be fully stabilized, and thus only that sort of vehicle can engage targets rapidly whilst attacking, which of course is a critical portion of warfighting. Any system which needs to stop to shoot can only be used in a supporting role. But even if you're going to be using your cannon armed vehicle in a supporting or defensive role, you still have some advantages. A turret down vehicle doesn't have a huge signature. This M1 has a full view of the battlefield with its thermal imager. Certainly, remote operated missile systems or elevated launchers like the Striker AT also have a very low signature. The difference is in immediate lethality. This tank is less than 10 seconds away from destroying two enemy vehicles in two kilometers. Once the crew have decided what to engage, they conduct a berm drill. They drive forward, fire around as soon as they stop. Maybe a second round, four seconds later, if you've multiple targets in a hunter killer system and then you duck down behind cover again. That's two targets killed quickly by one vehicle. If you're fighting as a platoon, which you should be, that's most of an enemy company gone in five seconds flat, if your fire coordination is good. Seeing eight of your accompanying vehicles dead when they were alive two breaths ago is a significant emotional event for the surviving crews. And why is this better than even twice as many missile teams on the other side? You can't be faster than the cannon round. Even if two or three missiles were fired at the tank while it was up, you have a good bet that the cannon round got to the target. This Syrian T-72 though, even though it spent far longer acquiring a target than a modern tank should, demonstrates the value of being able to react faster than a missile can get to you. Now, here I'm going to mention the swings and roundabouts. 
Yes, I am aware that this specific example is less effective against diving attack missiles like Javelin, if a team can acquire lock and fire that quickly. The problem is that every time some new technological development comes along on one side, in short order a new technological counter comes along on the other side. So really all you can do is look at the current balance of the majority of systems and presume it'll even out. So maybe Javelin dives at a steeper angle than a modern hard kill active protection system can deal with. Maybe improved trophy will protect roof arcs. And so on. What's new and rare, or has significant advantage now, may be less so in a decade. The engineers on both sides are always busy. What's important is if counters already exist. If so, then fielding them is only a matter of time. Okay, so hopefully I have now established that a cannon armed vehicle provides certain capabilities which no other system can provide. Now, various folks, including Perun, have hypothesized that perhaps the future of tanks is in vehicles of much lesser weight which use active protection systems to make up for the deficiency of armor. They certainly have a place in the military to go where locations where tanks are unreasonable, but they cannot replace tanks as a centerpiece of military force anywhere the tank can go. And bear in mind, in some places, the tank can go where the lighter vehicles cannot. For example, the very successful and rather little known operations in Cambodia in 1970 incorporated jungle busting. When you're a 50 plus ton vehicle, you can knock down a few trees between where you are and where you want to go, as the tankers demonstrated. Well, let's go back to that survivability onion. In order to kill the crew or vehicle, every layer of that onion must be broken. And this brings us to the survivability of the tank. A vehicle which relies on active protection for its defense effectively has, say, five layers of defense. A vehicle which relies on armor has six. If the active defense doesn't work on a light vehicle, it basically goes straight from don't be hit to don't be killed. A tank goes from don't be hit to don't be penetrated. And not everything on the battlefield, from artillery to saber rounds, can be intercepted by active defenses. Further, there's nothing stopping a tank from having active defenses on its own, as well as weight of armor. Thus far, Trophy has, as far as we know, stopped every missile and rocket attack fired at Israeli vehicles equipped with it. However, active protections do suffer some limitations, such as ability to deal with repeated attacks. Famously enough, a Challenger 2 in Iraq took 14 RPGs and a Milan ATGM hit. It was back in action in six hours. Another tank was reputed to have somehow allowed itself to have taken 70 RPG hits and stayed in action. No currently extant active protection system can protect against 15 attacks. Their magazines are not that big, let alone 70. And though I opened this talk with a statement that you should not be relying on your armor, the reality is that the enemy will get a vote and will hit you, thus survivability is important. About the only thing fast enough to hit a vehicle doing a berm drill is a cannon round, and the best defense against Sabo thus far devised has been physical armor. Basically, if you look at that onion, before looking at supporting assets, a tank has an excellent chance of coming out of a defensive engagement without being acquired, and on the offense, if fired at by guided missiles, may identify the launcher and destroy it, if it's not a fire and forget, because the cannon round flies faster. It may employ soft kill active defense to protect tracking. It may have a hard kill active defense system to prevent impact. And it still has armor to defend against anything which gets past the first three layers. And even if penetrated, spall liners, fire extinguishers, compartmentalization and the like can all help prevent being killed. And the systems on tanks are pretty solid. Witness the survivability of Merkava. So, to recap, if you want a single asset capable of putting at the maximum possible accurate and fast firepower in all weather conditions and for extended periods of time against the widest possible array of targets capable of defending, counterattacking, or attacking with violence of action and speed, because you don't want to give the opposition a chance to catch its breath, and at the same time providing the maximum possible flexibility and survivability from anything else in the battlefield from preparatory artillery barrages to other tanks. And if you can support 
the, with the infrastructure, which is expensive, which a modern tank requires, there is nothing which can replace the tank on the battlefield. It provides an irreplaceable and necessary capability, just as the lowly infantryman who is subject to death by a short stabby thing provides an irreplaceable and necessary capability. Now, again, a medium tank is not a bolo. It is not capable of doing everything. It's not capable of defeating everything. And there's a lot out there trying to kill it, precisely because the things are so dangerous. Anyone who goes around claiming that a tank is all but impervious is an idiot. The first two layers of the tank's survivability onion are best provided by assets which are not the tank. It's the old saw of combined arms. Air defense assets for protecting against drones and other aircraft, artillery and infantry for protection against handheld rockets, counter battery against sensor fused artillery munitions, and the like. It is good practice to rely on the outer parts of the onion much more than the inner parts. If you send in tanks without combined arms, you have just forfeited multiple layers of that onion. The enemy's job of getting to the center of the onion has just been made easier for them by your own ineptitude as they now have fewer layers to penetrate. Now, what are those legacy tanks? Perun correctly enough declines to opine on the future of the MBT, but how about all those M60s, T55s, Leopard 2A4s, M1A1s and the like which are out there? Perun does claim that the viability of these older tanks is far more open to question as they are not as survivable against modern threats. I'm not so sure that's the case though, as if you can't afford the latest generations of tanks, the chances are that your neighbors also can't afford the latest generations of threats. In the vast majority of conflicts, one side isn't going to suddenly be flooded by free donations of massive amounts of the latest generation weaponry. As costs of technologies reduce, and those systems do cascade to second tier militaries, so too will the cost of the upgrades to the forces to deal with them. Further, the history of legacy tanks has always been that countries are willing to spend notable dollar values in putting in upgrades. Trophy is a third to half a million dollars per vehicle. But as mentioned, better soft kill systems may still provide some better level of protection for lesser cost. Still, a half million per vehicle is better than spending four to five million on an entirely new tank if you are a country limited by budget as to how many tanks you can run and if you don't really need the latest 120mm smoothbore. Now in response to this comment, Perron observes that if you are in a resource constrained military, there may be an argument to simply denying the enemy its own armor by spending the money on anti-tank systems and basically turning it into an old fashioned infantry fight. Considering the costs of maintaining an armored force, the maintenance, mechanics, support structure, etc., you could get a lot of anti-tank weapons and a pretty good infantry artillery combination. Plus, correctly enough, he observed that if you want to rapidly expand an army, it's a lot easier to give draftees or militiamen anti-tank rockets than to train them to operate a tank. I'm not convinced by this as an argument though. Militia or inactive reserve units are traditionally more often used in defensive roles, as holding a position is a lot less difficult than attacking. And I am very much of the belief that offensives are required in order to end a war in your favor. Now there are those who would point to Vietnam or Afghanistan as an example of winning by defense only, but that basically came down to allowing your territory and populace to suffer war indefinitely until the other guy gives up. That's not taking control of things yourself. Allowing yourself to be occupied for most of a decade is not, I would submit, a common choice A, especially if the occupying power has a tendency to treat the occupied people poorly. Also on the legacy tanks comment, Perun tells me that he was more thinking T-55, M60A1, early T-72. He observes that you do get to a point of diminishing returns when you count all the costs of supporting an old tank in service, as per the capability and survivability of more modern tanks. I think to a point that reflects a difference of opinion as to what we may consider a legacy tank, as I would view Leopard 2A4 or even my own M1A1 as being a previous generation vehicle. They're about 40 years old, and tanks of that era are now very much up on the second-hand market. Though in fairness, they are also normally getting upgraded as part of a sale. 
Still, cheaper than buying brand new M1A2 7V3s or Leopard 2A7s. Running a T55 today is almost to the level of running a T34 when the Berlin Wall fell down. The things are just plain old tech, no matter how upgraded they are. It is true that right now, for most forces, the threat of the drone is higher than the ability of that force to deal with them. Both suicide drones like Switchblade or ordnance delivery drones like Reaper or Bayraktar. However, the engineers are working on it. Technologies to deal with them have been demonstrated and are starting to be fielded, even against drone swarms. When they are fully fielded, like every other development of measure and countermeasure, the pendulum will return to the center for a while, until the next greatest thing comes along. We don't know what that will be, but as long as the tank can provide the capabilities that it does, it will be worth the effort and expense of keeping it as part of the overall system of systems, it's a buzzword but it actually works, uh, which is a modern warfighting force. It's all interconnected and interdependent on each other for effectiveness and survivability. Right, I hope that gives you an indication of the tanker's side of the house. Until someone can come up with a system or doctrine which renders the currently necessary requirements of the tank redundant, and thus far nobody has figured out one, the tank's not going away, even if it does require a little bit of work to keep it alive in the current threat environment. Right, I hope you found that interesting and informative. I'll talk to you on the next one. Take care.